You're listening to Oilers Nation Radio, presented by The Nation Network. Subscribe for free on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Oilers Nation Radio, episode 88. It is the Brandon Davidson episode. Tyler's excited. Dan's excited. It's just it's just a tripod today. Rick is actually doing some some work. He is uh, the pine has reopened. He is getting a he said he's getting a liquor order in today, which is very very exciting. Go check out the pint if you got a chance. You reached out to Cam, did you, Tyler? And you got ghosted. Fucking coom. I just wanted one of these. We are back, and we're not getting it because uh, Cam Lewis did not respond to his to a request to be on today's show. I. When I messaged him, it was only 6 o'clock at night in Ireland. And as my girlfriend pointed out, you know, there is a chance that he was already fairly intoxicated by 6 o'clock at night in Ireland. So maybe that's why he didn't get back to me. But if he does, maybe we'll add him in halfway through. But no promises. I, uh, I'm i thinking that it is a Friday night in Ireland and Coom is in the bag. Probably. If I guess. You know. What if he, uh, been, he might have been in the middle of a documentary and he just wanted to leave Tyler on red. Very maybe possible. He might have been watching um, that uh, that cheer squad documentary series or whatever. Oh, called. good documentary. Good good poll there, Bagno. Thank you. Uh, as always, I want to start off today's podcast by thanking our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant for making this all possible. Go check them out in beautiful Sherwood Park, Alberta. They have got all the vehicles, the service, and the know how that you need for all of your car and truck needs. If you're looking for a new vehicle, they're there to help. If you need some service, they're there to help. If you are needing some assistance during this strange time, they are also there to help with your options on payment flexibility as well. On Twitter, they are at Sherwood Ford. And on Instagram, they are at Sherwood Ford underscore the Giants. I personally follow them on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, man, they post some sweet vehicles. They post some very sweet vehicles. And one day, I'm going to get out to Sherwood Park and I'm going to test drive them all. And every once in a while, you get to see Gus, though. Gus is the ambassador of smiles. And rightfully so. He's very handsome, though. Um, gentlemen, I want to start off today with a tribute, a little bit of a Stan episode of the podcast for your 2020 Art Ross Trophy winner, Leon Dreisidel. Just this past. I hit the wrong button. <laughs> We were gonna get this. <laughs> we almost got the end bumper. The real life podcast. Uh, this week, Gary Bettman did his little um, his little call announcement broadcast everywhere. We'll get to that in a second. But he did put an end to the 2019-2020 season in terms of stats. That means Leon is the big winner of the Art Ross Trophy. Ooh. Gentlemen, your first thoughts at. Maybe even let's just go back where he's come from, where he started. I remember that rookie season. He didn't really look like he was NHL ready. The Oilers tried to make it work. Didn't necessarily work. He got sent back to junior. Had a um, Played with the Kelowna Rockets. Had a run there. And then from there, he just seems to get better and better every single season. Tyler, I just want to know what you think about Leon Dreisaitl's projection from when he started and when he, where he's at now and now culminating in an Art Ross trophy win. Yeah, like I'm trying to think back to when he was drafted. I remember it was, you know, a big body. Maybe his boots were a bit of an issue, but his his vision was always something that was hyped up about him. And then you even look at him when he came into the league. Again, people just said he was slow. He didn't have a good enough shot was another thing you heard once in a while. And I just think you got to give that guy so much credit. It's something he talked about on a Zoom call today. You know, just when he talks to younger players now, he, he has so much of that experience of being sent back to junior, not making the Oilers out of camp that rookie season. The next year, having to go down to the American League as well. Like, he had to really put in the time to improve his game. And sometimes he gets just a horrible, horrible reputation with some Oilers fans. And they call him lazy, and they, they say that there's not enough emotion in his game and all that. And it's frustrating because I think this is a guy who has proven through his play and the way he's developed how committed he is to the sport, to the team, to the organization, to winning. Um, so, I, so I just think, you know, when they drafted him, you had, you always have hopes when you have a high pick of a player, you know, butting into a superstar with Dreisaitl, even after halfway through that year when he got sent back to the AHL, I don't think anyone could have saw an Art Ross trophy in his future, potentially a heart trophy in his future. And honestly, all the credit goes to Leon because he's the guy who put in the work and he's the guy who, who really changed his game. 
Dan, before I get to you on uh, your thoughts on dry saddle, I just want to walk through what Tyler just kind of talked about there. So in 2014-15, he played 37 games with the Oilers. He only got two goals and seven assists for nine points. That was before he got sent back down to the Kelowna Rockets where he, uh, you know, he went on a heater. He got 53 points in 32 games after going back to junior. In 2015-16, he did play six games, six whopping games with the Condors. Only a goal and an assist during that time. And then he came back up to the Oilers, finished off the season with 51 points in 72. I remember that season. Oh, maybe you can only play with Taylor Hall. He can only be, he's playing with Taylor Hall. Is he really that good? Well, let's fast forward in 2016, 17, he jumped up to 29 goals, 48 assists, 77 points. And gentlemen, little fun fact for you on Leon Dreisaitl. He was the very last goal scorer at Rexall place. Keep that one in your pocket for later. Hey. In 2017, 2018, in 78 games, he took a step, minor step back, 70 points. And then last year, as we all know, 2018-19, he erupted. A 50-goal season, 55 assists, 105 points. Even though this year he missed out on 11 games, he still managed to beat that points total with 110 points, 43 goals, 67 assists, and 71 games. Nation Dan, your thoughts on Leon Dreisaitl. Well, I think you kind of hit on it there too, Bag Milk, and it's it's something that uh, and Tyler mentioned as well is that there's a lot of doubters and a lot of haters of Leon Draisaitl still that say, oh, well, he's only can only play with Taylor Hall. Oh, he can only play with with Connor McDavid. And now, you know, in the last what was it, 20 games of the season uh, or the the shortened season, uh, that line was our top line. It just there's just no two ways about it. And Leon Draisaitl was leading the way. Um, Nuge and Nuge and Yamamoto, great players on their own rights and and underrated as such. But uh, but yeah, he's he's a pretty shining example. How amazing is it for Germany to have their best player ever? He's sixty six points back, I think, now of the the leading being the leading scorer for all of German hockey players ever uh, in the NHL. It's 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 unbelievable to see. He's uh, he's a he's a paramount of you know an example of somebody that like, like Tyler said, he can, he can show you, he shows you every day that he comes out and plays and wins an art Ross trophy and is the front runner for the, for the heart trophy um, shows you what, what a, what a person can do and overcome when it comes to the hurdles of being sent back to the WHL and having those doubters and, and then not doing well in the AHL. It's just, it's, it's unreal to see. And so it's, it's, it's special to watch and, and, we're all, you know, we're all pretty lucky that we get to watch Connor McDavid on a daily basis. Leon Dreisaitl, it's, it's, you know, the list goes on. Nuge, uh, another guy that, you know, has absolutely revamped his his career is is Ethan Bear this year. You know, we, we've seen a lot of these guys where they just, like Leon Dreisaitl, where they just took their own destiny in their hands and took it and ran with it. And now we have, you know, we have some of the top players in the league. So, uh, Nation Dan, one final fo- uh, follow-up question for you: You no longer believe that Dry Saddle should be in the AHL? Yes. No, yeah, that was uh, huh. I made a mistake, and I own it. I'm not. Uh, I don't pretend that it didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, yeah, no, it's it's it is awesome to see, and it's good to get the uh, as my parents call in here. Um, should we get them on the phone? No, uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's special to see a player come back and and come back so strong again and again, right? The thing about Leon, too, is, like Tyler mentioned it, at first his wheels were a problem, then his shot was a problem, but here we are in 2019, 2020, the season that is still kind of ongoing, and obviously it's a very, very strange circumstance, but those two things that were big knocks against him early on, who is who's complaining about his wheels and his shot these days? In fact, I was watching some highlights of Dreisaitl, um, the other day when the announcement was made and it's, it's incredible how he has set up not only as a player who can go coast to coast, he does it all the time, but when he sets up in his office there near the goal line on the right side, he's almost deadly at this point. And well, yeah, it's he's... fascinating to watch how he's kind of round out spots on the ice where you can't stop him. He's invented a style of shot. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing that they're, the announcers are kind of picking up on this year, right? It's the, the have your back to the player, accept the pass, and immediately get a shot off quickly. It's, you know, a few guys in the league can do that kind of thing. Can, can, you know, there's the Datsuk, and there's the, 
the Svechnikov, but like these these are things that you know elite goal scorers do. It's 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 special to watch. Tyler, last word on dry saddle. I think a part of it, and this is an, a, an, a point I'll make again when we start having the MVP conversation or the Hart Trophy conversation, defensively as well. Like, this is a guy, when the Oilers go down and have to kill a five-on-three penalty, as rare as that happens, who's on the ice? It's Leon. Like, he is the trust in Dave Tippett. He, his hockey IQ, I think, is maybe even a lot better than still some people are giving him credit for. Uh, he is very, very close to a perfect hockey player, and you could say that the Oilers almost have two people on their team who are very, very close to being perfect hockey players. And this year, I mean, I don't think this is a one-off, this kind of dominance from Dreisaitl. I think this is a guy who 10, 15 years from now, we're going to look back and go, man, the Oilers had, once again, two of the best players of their era, maybe two, the two best players of their era on, uh, on the same team at once. Well, it's pretty interesting to watch, right? Like on, in June of 2014, Craig McTavish walks up, picks Leon Dreisaitl. Okay, great. And then the very next year to get lucky enough to be able to draft Connor McDavid. So going though, having those two go back to back is yeah. absolutely bananas for this franchise. It, yeah. it, it, Third it, overall it, too, right? It's akin to when, I, and I know Malkin was second overall, but mm-hmm. it's akin to when the Penguins were able to draft Crosby and Malkin back to back. Like, that doesn't happen very often, and that's why the Oilers have such a very, very unique opportunity to turn this into some winning, some winning hockey clubs. And it was trending that way. And hopefully, as we get into this play-in series, knock on wood that it's actually able to happen, we'll see those two guys take another step in this play-in series and their second playoff run together. And I can't wait to watch it. But Tyler, you brought up the MVP. So he's already got the Art Ross locked up. That one's done. Now let's talk about the heart. Leon Dreisaitl is obviously a contender for the heart trophy as the league's MVP. What do you think his chances are? Do you like him as the MVP? Is there any challengers that have a realistic chance of dethroning him in this, in this scenario? What do you think, Dan? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like a, it's like an Oilers fan, like protective thing, right? We don't want to, we don't want to just pencil him in as the heart trophy winner. Even if we do, uh, just because the Eastern media always is that fearful thing, right? There was a talk of Panarin and how he was, you know, at the top of the list, even though they weren't going to make the playoffs. Um, it just, you're you're always guarded against it. But the only person that I can even say is like, is, is in the conversation for me at least, is Nathan McKinnon. But, but, and what he did with that team when they've had the rash of industry, in, injuries that they've had. Um, but yeah, there's just to me, there's just nobody that's there's nobody that's been as dominant with with a Connor McDavid who has one leg, you know, started off the season in a hyperbaric chamber and and you know wasn't himself again and, and was still un, unreal, but you know wasn't all wasn't a superstar of, by, of the uh, of the sort that he expects of himself. And Leon does it all, you know. Tyler touched on it too. Leon kills penalties. Leon scores goals on the power play. Like he's he's in every he's every bit of this team as much as Connor McDavid, if not more, this season. I think if there's one guy, and without a doubt, the biggest threat to Leon Dreisaitl's Hart Trophy race is Nathan McKinnon. Uh, just a dominant season, a year where it seemed like every important piece on that team was going down with injuries, and McKinnon just continually find a way found a way to put up offense and drag that team forward. When you look at the top 10 scores in the NHL so far this season, every single one, or eight out of those 10, had a teammate that was also in the top 50 of scores, except for two. Nathan McKinnon's one, and Jack Eichel is the other one. McKinnon, he was close in terms of points. He finished fifth with 93. Granted, still 17 back of dry saddle, but when you go to even strength points, he only finished four back of dry saddle, and again, he was a guy who really had to do it on his own a lot as well. And I know Dreisaitl was driving his own line, but he still had some pretty pretty talented players around him as well. And I don't love using that as a knock because you can't punish a player for getting to play with other good players. But I just look at the fact that McKinnon did a lot of that on his own this year in Colorado. Uh, plus 13, if you put any stock into plus minus as well. Um, I, I think Nathan McKinnon is without a doubt the biggest threat to Dreisaitl's heart trophy potential. And to further that point, too, sorry, I was just going to say, 
um, the next highest scorer on the Avalanche is Burakovsky at 45. Points. So he's, he's almost 50 points short of, of McKinnon's mark and, and played in, in 11 less games than him. So it's, yeah, you, you look at that and it's impressive, but Leon's better. Looking at yesterday, the NHL.com writers kind of put their projections up for the Hart Trophy. Zach Lang covered it at OilersNation.com. So here's how the breakdown went on Oilers, or not Oilers, the NHL.com vote. So the way they award it is you get five points for a first place vote, four points for a second place vote, three points for third, and so on. So Leon, according to them, he got 12 first place votes, ended up with 83 points overall. Nathan McKinnon did get second place four first place votes overall he ended up with 64 points obviously this is just a preliminary look at the heart trophy but to me i i completely get what you guys are saying about mckinnon he had a fantastic year the fact that he was able to put up 93 points in 69 games is just bananas like that is a that is a a torrid pace for a guy who didn't get to play with a new jerry yamamoto but to me this looking at the body of work of the season it's hard to put a knock against Leon, right? It's like you said, you both said it. He's playing in all situations. He's scoring clutch goals. He's taking big face-offs. He's a underrated face-off guy. He's at 52.6% this season as well. So I think that the stars are kind of pointing to Leon this year. And I hope that people really get a chance to see how good he is because the three of us are lucky enough to watch him on a daily basis, but I don't know how many people can say that outside of Edmonton or outside of Oilers fandom. Everybody knows Connor, but they don't necessarily know how good Leon is. And I hope this is kind of a coming out party of sorts for him because like you said, Tyler, he's a very, very fun player to watch. He's almost a perfect hockey player in the sense that he's got size. He can pass, he can score, he can skate. He does it all. Um, If I had a vote and I don't, but I should, (laughs) it would, it would, it would go to Leon. It's, it would, it's hard to knock what he's done. And another thing is the Oilers, like I said, they had three Art Ross trophy wins in the past four seasons. Connor's got two. Now Dry has got one. This team is looking very, very good, regardless of what happens with these NHL awards. We all know they get a little bit weird. And I'm looking forward to when the voting does come out and we see somebody out of, you know, Boston voting for Marshawns again or something yeah. like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, well, I like that the NHL.com writers gave a first place vote to Connor McDavid. So that was nice. Well, that there's that was another thing too. Like, I mean, it's funny because Connor didn't have a Connor esque year, I guess, even though he still had a fantastic season. It's it's such a weird thing to say. It's almost like it's a shame though that it did get the season to get paused because it robbed him of getting three consecutive hundred point seasons, which would have been the first time in a thousand years for this franchise. So, um, it, it's incredible. What a great problem to have. Who is you? Who is your most valuable player? Is it Leon or is it Connor? What a problem, and what a great one to have! I can't wait to watch these two guys as the season kind of carries forward, and hopefully into the playoffs. Knock on wood that it's actually going to happen. Hopefully, we can have this debate for years and years to come about who is more valuable. One day it'll be a Con Smythe debate. Who's more deserving of the Con Smythe, Leon or Connor? Again, like that's just that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking forward to. I'm just like I'm gagging for it. Let's hope that. Um, the NHL can get back on the ice later on in the summer because I really, really want to watch it. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about the MVP performance from our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant. Again, you can follow them on Twitter at Sherwood Ford and on Instagram at Sherwood Ford underscore the Giant. They are there to help you with new vehicle sales, service, financing, whatever you need in terms of getting yourself on the road. Our friends at Sherwood Ford are there for you. Gentlemen, moving on a little bit. Uh, I want to go. I want to touch on a, a one specific item from the Bettman presser. I get whatever you want to call it. The stream that Bettman did this past week, um, where he was explaining, yes, we are looking at a 24 team playoff, whatever you want to call that. Too, we're going to talk about the play-in series and what, where those points should go, in your opinion, um, in a second. But first, I want to talk about the draft lottery. The draft lottery was one of the funniest things ever to watch his explanation. It had about eight PowerPoint slides on how this works. Um, Forget all the odds. Forget all the math. I'm not smart enough to figure it out. What I want to ask you guys about is, do you believe that teams that are included in those play-in series 
should actually have a shot at the draft lottery. As an example, let's say our beloved Oilers can't make it past Chicago. I think they will, but let's just say they don't. And they win the draft lottery. First of all, that would be fucking hilarious. Everybody would be so mad. But is that something that you think is fair, that a team that could either go towards the Stanley Cup, a chance to win the Stanley Cup, or not, and fall into the draft lottery? Tyler, what do you think about that? I'm really, really torn on it um, because there's the part of me that goes, well, in a normal year, if you don't get a chance to be one of the 16 teams that are in the playoffs, then yes, you get a chance at the draft lottery. And, you know, as much as they're getting a chance to go on a Stanley Cup run now, the teams who missed the playoffs also at some point in the season still had a chance to win the Stanley Cup, right? So for me, I, I think it is fair to still just treat them as if, as if they're not playoff teams. I, it'll be weird to look back on this season, you know, 50 years from now and go, oh man, why were there like eight teams that were in a play-in but not playoff teams and all that? Um, it's not a perfect system. Nothing in this is a perfect system right now. But for me, I, I think you do have to include them just based on the fact that, I mean, yes, they're getting a chance to win the Stanley Cup, but there is no chance that someone can win both the Stanley Cup and the lottery in this format. So in my opinion, it's fair and they should be given a shot. Mr. Daniel? Yeah, you gotta put up a you gotta put up a carrot for these teams that like the Edmonton Oilers and the Pittsburgh Penguins where they're the fifth place team and they just missed the the cutoff for for a bye um, and have to play instead play a team that had like what what did Chicago have? A two percent chance of making the playoffs? That's you have bad. to give yeah, you have to give them some kind of, you know, well, if the worst case scenario happens you at least get this kind of thing, and you know that's what they'll that's what they'll say if uh, if we do you know knock on wood all that stuff not likely blah 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 blah. Um, if it does happen, uh, you at least have a chance at winning the draft lottery. And like you said, Meg Milk, that would be fucking hilarious. I, I mean, if I'm being just if I'm just going full chaos mode here, I couldn't think of a funnier outcome than if the Oilers didn't get past Chicago and won the draft lottery with like a 2% chance of winning it or whatever, it would be hilarious. Obviously, I believe that they're going to go through Chicago. I think Leon and Connor are going to have a chip on their shoulder that they went from a 90-some percent chance to having to do a play-in. I think they're going to be pissed off. I think this is going to be their flu game, uh, but over a, a series, and I think that they're going to make it through. But it is interesting, right? Like a team, like Dan said, like Chicago had no chance really of making the playoffs, but now they got a 50-50 shot. They got a coin flip. Same with Montreal. Um, they also were not going to make the playoffs, but now they got a chance of doing it. And you never know. With a guy like Carey Price, could he backstop them to a win? Same with the Blackhawks. Corey Crawford's won a cup before. Maybe has something to do again. Looking at the play-in series, though, guys, there's still a lot of questions about how this is going to play out in terms of where did these points go? We've already put an end to the 2019-2020 season in terms of points. Leon's the Art Ross winner, but it's not really a playoff series, but it's kind of a playoff series. Tyler, where do you think those points from those series should go? To me, the easy thing is just include them as playoff points. Let's be honest. That's what they are. It's not a standard playoff. You said it yourself. This is a, a very, very odd situation that's hopefully, knock on wood, never going to happen, happen again. To me, they're playoff points. Just put them in that category. I don't think whoever gets you know three or four games in a play-in series and then gets bumped, those handful of points that those guys are going to get are going to make a difference in the grand scheme of things. Just call them playoff points. I agree. Um, it would be weird, again, to look back on this in 50 years and be like, oh, Connor McDavid got six points. He is the NHL's all-time leader in points scored in a play-in series. Like, I, I don't know where to put them, and I don't think you want to just let them go into the abyss because what if someone has a historic performance to keep it Oilers? What if McDavid goes and gets 11 points in a game? I know, unrealistic, but what if something crazy like that did happen? Where do you slot it in the record books? How do you keep track of that stuff? And it sounds trivial and stupid, but it is something I think the league needs to sort of keep their eyes on and consider here. Um, there's a few little interesting small wrinkles and where to put the points is one of them, but I agree with you, Bag Milk. Keep them as playoff points. To me, it's just the easiest answer, right? Like We've all said it. We are all living through this together. This is not a normal year. 
Nobody can ever say that this is a normal year. This format, Gary Bettman says, by no means is it perfect. Perfect. Connor McDavid did a Zoom call yesterday with Darnell Nurse. He said, again, this isn't perfect. Put them in the playoffs. These are playoff points. Dan? Yeah, it's I, – I can't envision a scenario where they just say that they just disappear into the ethos. I think that – I think that the the you know the fear of a Montreal Canadiens Stanley Cup win, although you know possibly warranted, uh, they're going to have won 19 games versus you know the the uh, who knows the Dallas Stars um, having won uh, 16 games to make it to the finals. So it's or to win the Stanley Cup, I guess. So it's just it, like there's there's nothing perfect about this format. Uh, I think that. I think this is kind of a no-brainer to keep it as playoff points. But in saying that, nothing I've ever thought would happen in 2020 has happened and the complete opposite has. So who knows, right? It's just, you know, you just kind of leave it up to the league. Like like running a draft lottery without teams in the in the draft lottery. It's, it's, it's weird. It's all just weird. It is. It's all weird. So like Tyler said, it's going to be interesting to see what the NHL does with this because obviously there are there's all kinds of things that, go along with this, right? I mean, we still don't know exactly what's going to happen to the James Neal conditional third. Mike Smith has got bonuses that are tied to games played. Um, I think Ethan Bear has some bonuses as well. They have to figure out. There's a, there's a lot of issues that need to get solved. I mean, there's a lot of players too, and even just even a completely different angle. Look at the seven teams that aren't in the mix for this play in slash playoff. Like I'm thinking of a guy like Sam Goddard. We talked to him last week on the real life podcast. He was a great guy, but there's a very realistic, I mean, a very realistic possibility that he won't play another game until like what? December, January. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just like everything about this is weird. So I can't wait to see what they're going to do with this because no matter what the final answer is, it's going to piss somebody off. Yeah. And it's going to be funny. I don't know. Right. Yep. It, there is a lot of weird wrinkles. Yeah. Like I. I mean, I heard on TSN today they were talking about uh, Alexi Lafreniere and what's he going to do? Because come October, if the NHL is saying, "Well, we're not going to be playing games until January," and the Canadian Hockey League is shut down, they were talking about the potential of Lafreniere and potentially other top prospects going to Europe for three months just to stay sharp, just to be playing professional hockey somewhere. Um, again, one of those weird wrinkles. Here's another one I want to throw at you guys quickly. Are we done with this topic? Can I switch gears? Absolutely. What happens? So let's say in when the 12 teams go to their quarantine rinks, you're playing two games a day per rink, which I think is the realistic one because if you do three a day, you're just going to be completely screwing with the ice and you should have two rinks in every hub city. Um, so let's say it's two a day. One starts at one o'clock local time and the other one will start at seven o'clock local time. What happens when you get a game that goes into like triple OT? Because it's going to happen at some point in the Stanley Cup playoffs. How do you how do you balance that? Like, let's say Edmonton Chicago <laughs> goes to triple OT and takes six hours. Like, are they going to bump the other game back an hour and a half so they can get the ice ready? Like, how do you work that? I'm fascinated by well, that possibility. Well, in that scenario, you're saying that there is two rinks, so you're so you're not really throwing off the other rink necessarily but you're throwing off the um, second game at on that ice surface oh you think that they, with the two rinks they would have four games going a day i think they would have to wouldn't they or maybe they don't i don't know i always just envisioned it being two games a day and that's it and it's just straight up you know two games on two games off because you gotta because you gotta think that they have to they have to sanitize everything you know it's it, i don't know it, that's that's always the way i look at it but if you're looking at it that way then yeah fair enough it's it's like once they reach the fifth overtime, it's a shootout. I don't know. Like, are they going to, they're going to probably have to create these rules. We had this happen on our stream there the other night because I forgot to set the fucking setting. So we went to a shootout in the playing round and, uh, and we were like, you know, it's like logically it makes sense to have a shootout, but then at the same time, it's like, no, fuck you. This is, this is playoff hockey and you've got to have a continuous overtime, but I don't know. It's just, it's, we've talked about this a couple of times, I think now, you know, obviously with the quarantine and, and trying to figure out how to get back to hockey. Every time you, you go down these roadmaps, it turns into a thought experiment that you could go on all night with. You know, this is this is just one small part of it. You know, it's but it's just like 
yeah, I don't know. It, and then that team has to play. They have to potentially play the next day too, Yeah, you know, or maybe the day after and they're tired now. And, you know, like, I don't know. It's just, there's, there's a whole bunch of, and then you, uh, yeah, there's, there's, it's a, it's a thought experiment that can go on for hours. I, I love the idea of NHLers getting their game pushed back. Like it's some kind of Christmas. Game. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Those yeah. guys haven't had a game pushed back like a Christmas tourney in years. And I think it'd be Even good humble. for them. It'd yeah. be good for them. Keep them a little bit humble. Keep them hungry, ready to go, making sure they're having something to eat between these long layovers. <laughs> I, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, we still don't know where the hub cities are at. We, there's a lot of questions that need to be solved. I mean, Gary Bettman said it this week. We're still in phase one of their four-phase plan. So there's still ages to go, plenty to talk about, plenty to guess, and it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out. Speaking of interesting and the way things shake out, our friends at Skip the Dishes are always here to feed you. I am looking right now because I have no food in my house, Tyler, and I'm looking for something that I'm going to eat for dinner later. Maybe maybe I'll get myself a burrito. Oh, fuck. I had a burrito last weekend from Bar Burrito. Holy shit. I, burritos are the best hangover food. I don't care what anyone else says. That is my answer. That's my take. Burrito's number would- one hangover food. I would uh, I would go with a nice um, if I'm doing a hangover food I would go maybe with maybe a nice pho or something like that. There's broth, so you get some food in there, get hydrated, get some salts back in the system. Either way, no matter which angle you're looking for, skipthedishes.com. They've got everything that you need. What be it pho, be it a burrito, maybe you want to go to Freshy and get yourself a salad. Maybe you want Little Caesars. You want a hot ready popping in at your doorstep. Maybe you want a donair. Maybe you want to look at some of the places that we've got in the Edmonton Donair Championship. Doesn't matter. Skip the Dishes is here for you, no matter what you are looking for. They're here to feed you. Just as Tyler always says, remember to tip your driver because they are doing a service and they are putting themselves out there just so that you don't have to. Tyler, that brings us to our armchair GM question of the All week. Right. You had an interesting one. Yep. Let's hit it. All right. So this one is based around. Mike Smith, who was an unrestricted free agent at the end of this season. Now, I know a lot of people don't want to talk about offseason hypotheticals because it sounds like we're going to be getting playoff hockey. But the Oilers are going to need to sign a second goaltender next year to play with Miko Koskinen. A lot of people assume it's going to be Mike Smith. He was 19, 12, and 6 on the season with a 295 goals against average and a 902 save percentage. Very respectable numbers. But he was on a contract that paid him a base amount of of $2 million with the potential. With the potential. Sorry, I just saw uh, the thing you sent us, Dan. We're going to get to that too because that is exciting. Um, but with the potential to make upwards of $4 million if he hits all his bonuses. And he was about to hit all of them. In my opinion, the Oilers cannot afford to pay a 38, soon to be 39-year-old goaltender that much money. I think his next contract is going to have to be less than that. But I do agree that they should probably look at bringing back Mike Smith. So if you were gonna, if you were the GM and you were gonna bring back Mike Smith, what would that contract look like? I don't know which one he wants to take this one first, but Mike, look, why don't you lead the way? Well, I'm looking over uh, his contract, courtesy of our friends at Puckpedia.com, and there's just there's so many there's so many bonuses attached to this contract, right? The base salary was two million bucks, but it could go upwards of four million if he hits all those bonuses we mentioned a little bit earlier games played, playoffs, series wins, all that kind of shit. To me, I'm with Tyler. I just, I I have nothing against Mike Smith, nor do I have anything bad to say about the way he played. He was very inconsistent early in the season, but when the calendar flipped to 2020, he was arguably one of the main reasons that the Oilers had a chance to win on a lot of nights. You got to respect that. You got to respect the hustle. I personally think that, Miko Koskinen is the goalie that they signed to be their starter and they need a guy who can push him, but they also need a guy who can cost less than 4 million bucks. There are options out there. They go, they can go and find maybe a younger guy, um, maybe somebody who doesn't need necessarily want to play all, uh, half the games, I guess. Well, I mean with, with Dave Tippett, you never know, right? He does plateau system and he's done it all season. And that's going to bring me to a question a little bit later, but I would move on. I would move on. I think that when you're talking about a guy who's 38 years old playing a very difficult position, they could, in theory, tie up a bunch of money in their backup goaltender, Mike Smith, and his body just simply gives out on him. 
That's not to say that he's he's not competitive. He's the fire. He can move puck, blah, blah, blah. I love all that kind of shit. But he's still a dude in his late 30s playing a tough spot. I would go for a younger goalie, personally. Dan? If I'm – yeah, I, I think I think I'm with you too, Big Milk, that I would – I'm probably looking elsewhere personally, but I know as the team, the team, I understand that, you know, Tippett loves Smith and trusts him wholeheartedly. And so, yes, I understand that the team will probably look at signing him. And if I'm, if I'm going after Smith, I would probably, I would try to come at him with like a, a one and a half million dollar base salary. And then, and then his bonuses, I hate, I hate what I think was a big problem with Mike Smith this year is that the boys, the boys bonuses were spent or were made off of playing games. Mm-hmm. And so he always wanted to be in the net. And I think I honestly, and this is just me, you know, watching the hockey. Um, I honestly think that Smith played some nights where he was probably tired or beat up and, and he just wanted to keep getting out there because, you know, at the end of the day, he doesn't have a lot of paychecks coming left from the NHL. And so, so, you know, the incentive of him to get into the net is, is as such that, you know, he's going to just keep asking to go in the net. I also think he's a competitor and and you'd expect that from a competitor as well. But I think that my, my bonus structure would be based around his performance, solely based on his performance. You know, if then that way, if if he does, you know, fall off a cliff, like you, like you pointed out, bag milk, that could very well happen. It's not going to really hurt the team because he didn't play 40 games this year and then fell off a cliff for us. Instead, it's he played really well for us. Okay, we have to pay him higher salary. When you look at the potential options to replace Mike Smith, the UFA goaltenders coming this year, Braden Holpe, Robin Leonard, and Jacob Markstrom are without a doubt the top three, and I think we can all agree, out of the Oilers' price range. Corey Crawford, probably staying in Chicago. Craig Anderson, too old. Jimmy Howard, interesting fit. Thomas Grice, might be too much money. Cam Talbot, Anton Hudobin, Mike Con- Mike Condon, Brian Elliott, Aaron Dell, Keith Kincaid, Linus Allmark, and Laurent Bersois. None of those guys really jump off the pages to me as legitimate upgrades. Jimmy Howard is the interesting one. I don't know how much he would cost, but we know Holland has a history with him. He has a long track record of being a good goalie in the NHL, a recent track record of being wildly inconsistent, but still at a, at a similar spot to almost where Mike Smith was a year ago when they signed him. He's a goalie who's very up and down. He's 36 years old. Uh, to me, my answer is I would bring back Mike Smith. I would start by saying, Mike, the cap isn't moving. You're a year older. you got to understand the position we're in. There's a lot of backup goalies on the market. We're cutting your contract in half. Same bonus is everything, but it's half. You get $1 million base with the potential to earn $1 million more if you play your games and get your bonuses. He probably says, no, I'd maybe be willing to go as high as one and a half on the base. But again, no more than $1 million on the bonuses. I don't think you can risk tying up $4 million again in a backup goaltender or an aging goaltender. I'd be interested to see, though, if Ken Holland dips into maybe the RFA market. Pittsburgh has three goalies right now. Matt Murray might shake loose. He'd probably cost you a lot, and you'd have to move a lot of money to make that contract work. But a guy like Matt Murray would interest me. One of the guys in New York, Alexander Gorgiev, would interest me as well. So there are some younger options out there who, again, I think the one hole when you try to project forward with this Oilers organization, the offense looks amazing. The defense has some really interesting young pieces coming up. But who is the goalie of the future? And that's the big thing that I think Ken Holland still has to go out and address with this organization. I mean, Tyler, you just said you just nailed my ideal scenario because one thing that we haven't seen with the Oilers in forever is having that who's the goalie in waiting. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like a like let's say just as a thought experience with uh, experiment, they they get Gorgia from uh from New York. That's a guy that you could groom slowly, throw him in. He plays a handful of games and he gets better and better and better. And then there would be your heir apparent already in the system to take over from Nico Koskin and provided that they wanted to move on from him at the end of his contract. Mm -hmm. To me, that would be the ideal. I would love to see uncle Ken go fishing for some of these younger goalies that may not have a path to starting where they're currently at. It's exactly like when, um, when they got Talbot in the first place, he was never going to play more than Lundqvist. He just wasn't. And then he came in and he looked really, really sharp for a couple of years in Edmonton. And then, you know, he had to move on. But 
you never know, right? That would be my ideal. Yeah, I think you're right, Big Milk. And I think that one of the things to talk about too is the fact that um, you you kind of talked about it too. Is that like not very many teams these days develop their own goaltenders. They don't. The guys that you have that are your number one goalies around the league were not the number one guy that people drafted. The Mark Andre Fleury's don't exist anymore these days. Yeah. And so yeah, going out and and being smart about grabbing some young guys off of other teams is is what you need to do because we've we've thrown a lot of darts in our draft pick dartboard um, at at goaltenders and it, it hasn't worked out for us yet. So hopefully hopefully we can go out and find somebody uh, somebody from another team that has been developed and, and we can work on. We'll see. I mean, if, if anybody can do it, I believe Uncle Ken can, can make this happen. So um, we'll have to see what happens with the goaltending. It's going to be an interesting conversation for the next, you know, here we are in May getting into June is going to be an interesting conversation for the rest of the year. Tyler, I want to stick with goaltending a little bit here. And I want to ask you, if you're Dave Tippett and the Oilers are going into this play-in series in Chicago, who are you starting? Whew. Oh, man, that is a, uh, that is a loaded question, Bag Milk. Um, both goalies well, had well, their turns this year at the crease, right? Like both guys at one point looked like they were running away with the job and then eventually the other guy would sort of take over. If you look through their most recent bodies of work in the regular season, Koskinen, it'll take me a second here, but here were his last five appearances. He, uh, he stopped 45 of 48 against Vegas. He stopped 45 of 46 against Columbus. 10 of 10 in a relief appearance against Chicago. 42 of 43 against Dallas. 30 of 33 against the Vegas Golden Knights. Only once did he have a save percentage lower than 930 in his last five starts. Never did he have a save percentage lower than 900. Those are very impressive numbers. We've never seen what he could do in the playoffs. It's a different kind of pressure. However, yep. this year's playoffs is completely different. When you look at Smith, his last five starts, he only had a save percentage above 930 once and a save percentage above 900 twice. He had a, you know, a not great performance, allowing four goals on 21 shots against Chicago. And then they, he allowed uh, three goals on 24 shots against Winnipeg. Four goals on 21 shots against Anaheim as well. Uh, it's tough to read who the hot hand is going to be, but personally, I have more faith in one Miko Koskinen, so I would be going with him. Dan, we're talking about with the play-in series here against Chicago and whether or not, and you're Dave Tippett here, so put on your Tippett cap, maybe your stash. Who are you starting in the crease? Is it Koskinen? Is it Smith? Smith obviously has a lot more playoff experience. You could argue that he was Calgary's best player last year in the playoffs. They got demolished by the Avalanche. Had it not been for Mike Smith, they probably would have got would have got slept, uh, swept. I should say. Yep. Koskinen, we we know he doesn't have that experience that Smith does. However, arguably more consistent throughout the entire season. Who's your starter when you're looking at Chicago? I. So, so if I take off my mustache and my hat right now, and I tell you my answer, it's probably Miko Koskinen. But if I put on my hat, oh yeah, it's Mike Smith right away. Uh, he's a guy that uh, he's a guy that I trust. He's a guy that I know, and the added benefit of of a of a Smith starting and maybe relinquishing the net to to Miko if things don't go well is that you just do you do just that you. You show Miko Koskinen what it is to be a playoff goalie, comes in maybe in relief of Smith in a bad outing, and then he takes the net and runs with it. We've seen it. We've seen it before, you know, in, in numerous situations where where a goalie that maybe didn't have the playoff experience of their of their other counterpart uh, didn't start the playoffs for their team, but then they took the reins. You know, the one that comes to mind is a nightmare for other fans, but it's Cam Ward. He didn't start that playoff run for the Carolina Hurricanes in net, but he took over the net from them and, and didn't look back. And it's just, it's, it's something that I think is a benefit to that too. But I, I just think that, yeah, if, if I'm, if I'm channeling my inner tip, it's, uh, it's probably going to be Mike Smith starting for us. For my answer, just to round this off, I would also go with Koskinen, but I also fully expect, let's say this game, this first series goes five games. I expect both guys to play. I think that's just kind of the way Dave Tippett's run all year. I expect the exact same in the playoffs. I don't know why he would change his strategy, um, whether I agree with it or not. I'm guessing we see both guys. But 
I would personally start Koskinen. However, if I was a betting man, I would bet that Smith gets that first game. I agree with that. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Um, there's also a bunch of questions about who's going to be on this on the taxi squad, how many players they're going to be able to include. We're going to look at line combinations as we go forward into the um, as we near get nearer to the play in series. But I want Tyler to get his buttons ready because it is time, as always, for the Oodle Noodle Hot Cold Performers of the Week. Our friends at Oodle Noodle are donating 10% of takeout dine-in and curbside pickup orders to local charities and initiatives. They're doing wonderful work in the community. Uh, I'll, I know later tonight on Nation Happy Hour, every Wednesday and Friday at 5.30 p.m. on Instagram Live, I'll be talking to Jay about what Oodle Noodle's got going on this week. Uh, you'll want to listen to that because it's very interesting to just to see how they're giving back to a community that's been so generous to them during these strange times. And... For the purposes of this podcast, we want to thank Oodle Noodle for making the hot and cold performers positive. Possible, I should say. As always, we start with the cold performers of the week. Mr. Nation Dan, your Oodle Noodle cold performer of the week. Uh, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a tough week. Uh, it's been a tough news cycle to watch. Um, I say that my cold performer of the week, though, goes to... Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to phrase this properly. It's a personal thing. Uh, we all we're all good friends with uh, a former former nation member, uh, Mandiz, and that guy had his uh, had a, a very personal item stolen from his truck this week down in the Riverdale neighborhood. So my cold performer of the week is the piece of shit that stole from Mandiz's truck. Yeah, just to just further that, go check out my Twitter my Twitter account. I retweeted um, Mandrix looking for a little bit of help finding this personal item, and I, I truly hope that he gets it back because um, that's a tough one. It's yes, I agree with you, Dan. Uh, I didn't mean to be a downer, but yeah, that's my cold performer of the week. Shit. Oh, well. <laughs> You're listening to the Oil Nation Radio podcast. We only do this every single week, but <laughs> it's always fun to see the delay on that first round of butts. Tyler, your cold performer of the week. Uh, my cold performer of the week are uh, those who are shitting on the idea of Edmonton being a hub city. And there's two groups of people doing it. There's people who have never been to the city who are crapping on Edmonton and saying, oh, who the hell wants to go play and live in Edmonton for a few months? We talked about that last week. But this week, a whole new wave came. People in Edmonton who are shitting on the idea, who are going against the whole, or who are saying, oh, there's no economic boost at all. This is pointless. What's the use? It costs the government essentially nothing in terms of real dollars. All that would happen is a handful, and who cares how big or small the handful is? A handful of local businesses would get a boost from this. Hotels would be full, and you could sit there and say, oh, but it'll just be big corporations getting it. Well, some hotel staff might be brought back from being laid off. You know, some restaurants and someone has to cater and feed them and drive them and do all this stuff. I think it's nothing but a boost for the local economy. Even if it's a small one, it's a boost. So those who are shitting on the idea of Edmonton being a hub city, even though they live here in Edmonton, those people are my cold performer of the week. Uh, my oodle noodle cold performer of the week is Calgary Flames fan. I was having fun this week making memes about them not getting the third round pick from the Neil Lucci trade. Obviously we need a resolution from that from the league. Ken Holland said he has reached out for clarification on that. To me, if the season's done, the season's done. I don't feel like they get that pick. So to all the Calgary flames fans that were on my Instagram that were on my Twitter and they were complaining that they're happy with just Lucic for Neil as a straight across swap because James Neal is bad. Either you're not watching or you're eating paint for breakfast. <laughs> My cold performer of the week, Calgary Flames fans. Oh, that's cold. Flipping the ledger, we are looking at the bright side in the hot performers of the week. Mr. Tyler Uramchek, your Oodle Noodle hot performer of the week. Actually, can I let Dan go first? Because I have two. But I think Dan, one of them is the one Dan sent us. So Dan, if you're going to use that one, you go, you go first. All right, Nation Dan, we're pivoting. 
Yeah, there you go. My uh, my hot performer of the week. It just came across the newswire as we were recording. Uh, it's it's weird for me to say this, but my hot performer of the week is the Arizona Coyotes, and the reason being is that they just announced just now on Twitter that they are bringing back the Kachina jersey, one of the one of the best looking jerseys in the NHL uh, all time. I would say uh, that's going to be their full time jersey next year, and they did clarify that. It's their full-time jersey when they are designated as the home team, just in case we're playing quarantine hockey for another year. This is hot. That, that jersey is super interesting because it's a very divisive one, right? Some people love it. I personally love it. I think the design's cool as shit. Um, some people hate it, though. It's, I love it. It's a very interesting jersey. Yeah, it's, yeah I, I, I think that, the, I mean, for the Coyotes, it's like, anything to get their name in the news cycle for a minute right and so it's i get it but but you're right it definitely does it's a it's a polarizing jersey i would also encourage people if you don't know the history behind the kachina jersey to read up on it it's actually a really cool story about how the the coyotes um put that design together uh there's a lot more to it than just coming up with a jersey so i encourage anybody to do a little bit of reading about that one because it is a good one Tyler, your Oodle Noodle Hot Performer of the Week. I'm giving it to the man, Leon Dreisaitl. Art Ross Trophy winner. A big shout-out to the big German, Leon. Uh, very well-deserved, obviously, because he outscored everyone by a lot of points. Hopefully, a heart trophy is next. Much love to Leon. Put some respect on my name. Hard to argue. Yes. He He's a warlord. Laziest Art Ross Trophy winner of all time. And I respect him for it. My... Oodle Noodle Hot Performer of the Week, just to wrap this up. I'm going to give it to Jared and Sales, the G-Wagon. Ooh. If you if you guys saw what he did to his vehicle, wrapping it in Nation Beer and Oilers Nation Deckles, it is looking sharp, and it is looking balling. And I saw it on Twitter, and I saw it on Instagram. That baby is getting all kinds of attention from folks that are seeing it downtown. So my Hot Performer of the Week is going to Jared for the upgrades on the whip. Next. Who's next? Who's next to make a nation vehicle? Uh, Dan, you're up. <laughs> I, I've been rolling around with the flag now for two months, <laughs> but uh, I have two flags on the car. But uh, no, not a not a decal guy yet. And uh, just to wrap up today's podcast, boys, I want to look at some of the reviews we've gotten uh, over the past couple of months. We've been obviously doing these via FaceTime since the league shut down in mid March. It's been weird, but you know we've gotten on a rhythm. You know, Except I like looking Tyler at you with guys. the hot buttons. Yes, the cold performer of the week is Tyler's uh, insistence on delaying the button pushes. That was a hard we'll one forget. to play a button off of. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we we'll love you, Tyler. Today. We're teasing you. So I want to encourage anybody listening to this right now, leave us a review on iTunes. I want to read these more often. Um, this one kind of this one kind of made me laugh. This one, Tyler, is from Slippery Dolores. Ah. <laughs> Slippery Dolores says, wow, I just, wow. These guys are, wow. I mean, you listen week after week, and it's an ex- insanity expecting something different time after time, but nope. Wow. I don't really know <laughs> what that review means. I was going to ask you that, too. I think I read that a couple weeks ago, and I meant to ask you guys. Like, is that a positive? I can't tell. What would you yeah, say I don't know. was, Meg Milk? Uh, Slippery Dolores. Please or follow up with us. Yes. yes. Slippery Whatever. Dolores. I want to know what... But it's a three-star review. It's a three out of five. Oh. So you can't hate that. It's halfway. It's But it's right in the middle. There's no real confirmation there. No, Slippery, uh, Slippery Dolores leaving us all confused on that one. Next one goes to Maddie. Maddie gives us a five-star review saying this is fav- favorite podcast it's day 35 of quarantine and i've resulted in listening to old podcasts just to hear the oilers are winning best oilers podcast thank you to maddie for that one very lovely i can see the smile creeping across tyler's face he's very excited about that review. loves a five-star review and thirdly shout out to chrissy another five-star review what a beauty of a podcast she says i'm a longtime oilers fan follow you guys on facebook but haven't had a chance to listen to the podcast i've been missing hockey so much and found myself with a lot of extra time on my hands. So I thought I would give it a listen from the very first podcast. Now would cancel 2020 in a hot minute, but not this podcast. This has been the pick me up. I needed. So thank you to Chrissy for a very lovely review. 
And like I said, if you are listening to this right now, help us get boosted in the sport category on iTunes. We want to be in the top pods. Yeah. I want to see Tyler's face. I want to see him smile. I want to see Dan smile. I want to see Coom smile, even though he refuses to acknowledge that he used to be on this podcast. What a jerk. As always, please subscribe, download, tell a friend, tell a cousin, tell a relative, tell a coworker, tell a socially distant friend. Oilers Nation Radio coming at you every single Friday. Follow us on Instagram and, well, maybe not Twitter anymore because Jack Dorsey decided to ban us for whatever reason. We still can't get that account back. But on Instagram, at ON Radio Podcast. For the Nation, Dan, for Tyler Uremchuk, I am Bag Milk saying thank you all for listening. Have an excellent weekend. We will talk to you next week. Shout out, Damien. Best wishes. Thanks for listening to Oilers Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Make sure to follow us on all of our social media to stay up to date and never miss a podcast.